Welcome everybody. I'm very glad you could make it to this science breaks with Imperial College. My name is Jemima Burrell and I will be chairing this session today. I'm very pleased to be here with Dr Tilly Collins, who will be talking about solutions to urban pollution, smart walls for cleaner urban air. As the curator and now gallery and a cultural consultant at Greenwich Peninsula, a new urban development with a river that wraps around it, I am aware of how lucky, lucky I am to work in a car-free environment. I'm very sorry, everybody. I have a very noisy cat who you'll have to bear with me. She's Burmese. I'm aware how lucky I am to work, work in a Very sorry there, Jemima, you've been muted. I'm the curator at Now Gallery and cultural consultant at Greenwich Peninsula. And as a new urban development with a river wrapping around it, I'm aware of how lucky I am to work in a car free environment. Tilly has been bringing her students down to Greenwich Peninsula for a couple of years looking at urban sustainability. And I love that her students and Tilly always ask me tricky questions about the impact of my cultural work. And they make me think. And I'm very much hoping that today you too will ask some difficult and interesting questions of Tilly of her presentation. Please do submit questions at any point during the Q&A at the side of the screen. The event is being recorded, so if you do not want your name to be um, read out at any point, please submit your question anonymously. Do please give us a thumbs up if there's a particular question that you like, and I will aim to get her to answer it. Tilly has always made me think outside the box. She is the one person who, when she comes for supper, my daughters stay to hear more. This is because of her wide scientific knowledge, which comes from a genuine passion for specifically giant willow aphids, trees, other insects, ecology, and she is able to address interdisciplinary challenges and genuinely experiences her practice. I first met Tilly in the 1980s when she was fresh out of Chelsea Art School having far too much fun in the fashion and event management world. Her path to science was unexpected and circuitous, but filled with curiosity at every step. Studying, studying science gave a focus to her constant questioning and helped her to structure thoughts, arguments and inquiry. After a stint in agricultural college near Guildford, learning about trees and their care, she went to the University of Sussex for a degree in ec ecology and conservation. Sussex, with its excellent attitude to mature students, was the springboard to Imperial College and a PhD in entomology at the Silwood Park campus. After 15 years in the Department of Life Science, held in parallel with part-time positions in other universities, Tilly transferred to the Centre for Environmental Policy a collection of diverse academics and skills where she is very happy. She now splits her time between teaching, research, consultancies, and her interests remain wide reaching, and that much I know about her. One project is focused on entomophagy, um, eating insects, how they can contribute to a more efficient circular system and better use of agricultural waste in the emergent palm production industry of West Africa. Another examines the interplay between people and green spaces and how they design in urban and peri-urban areas and can, can provide the most ecosystem services. Beyond these projects, she supports and mentors younger academics and helps many through their first publication processes and supervises PhD students across a range of fields, including, I like this one best, effect, what effects climate change will have on the British wine industry. Obviously very important for us all right now. 
Today's talk comes from the urban green space stable and unites the green grain worlds in order to find solutions for immediate problems and anticipate how to design these solutions for better effect. Tilly, I love that you said just a minute ago that you're going to give us a story of your discoveries. I'm passing over to you and I look forward to your presentation. Oh, thank you, Jemima. Thank you very much. Okay, that's a very flattering introduction. Ah, oh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming along. So what I'm going to do today is, is not particularly address you as a scientist because I have to fess up straight away that I am not an air pollution expert. Uh, I stand on the wings of giants in that context. What I am and where I've come to in this is someone who is a West London mum. I raise my children in London and this that's really the background to this talk. So I was in my children's playground one day and I discovered that the air smelt absolutely vile. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Oh, that's better, it's changing now. And I found that the air smelled absolutely vile and I wondered about that and I thought, well, what, what is this? Where, where is this pollution coming from? And I started to begin to think about this in a bit more detail. And because I'm in one of those places, I'm extremely fortunate. I work at Imperial College and all around me are people who know things. Also, if I want to begin to find out something, I can set it as an essay to a group of undergraduates or postgraduates and they go out and they pull together a synthetic view on the topic for me and I can read their work and learn a lot from it. So I started reading about air pollution in the city and I started beginning to understand it a little bit and that's the beginning part of the journey I'd like to take you on today. So this is this is my context of West London. We have areas of great wealth alongside great poverty, we have areas where schools abut great roads and we have an air pollution problem. Cities are growing and we know that worldwide more and more and a greater proportion of people live in cities. So this air pollution, the urban air pollution is a problem the world across. We're very lucky in this country in that we actually are beginning to tackle this very effectively, but others aren't. Cities in themselves are, are some of the most marvellous things. It's actually ecologically very efficient to keep people in cities. The, the footprint of people living well, in the developed world anyway, the footprint of people living in cities is very much lower than that of people living in the countryside. It's an efficient thing to do. But cities have flows. They have flows of food coming in. They have flows of food, of waste going out all sorts of ways, some liquid, some solid. They have flows of energy coming in and they have commuter flows. They have people coming in and they have people leaving. And all these flows tend to require some vehicles. And from the vehicles, we do begin to get some pollution. We are improving this, of course, but there will always be a demand for vehicles to bring in food and to take out our wastes and to move people around in one way or another. Where you are in the world profoundly affects the kind of pollution you're exposed to. So if you look at these, vehicle pollution is that, that black bit. So in this country, we're approximately 25% of the pollution we experience is vehicle generated. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Talking about London specifically, and this is an excellent graph from DEFRA that really I found very sobering. London is this peak on the right of the graph on both of these. One is a, a north-south transept through the country. So you have Scotland and Inverness on the left going right the way through to London here. So that dark blue component, which is the largest component of our air pollution effectively, comes from distant upwind vapours. So these are things that we can do relatively little about. The things I'm talking about are the tiny bit of grey at the top and potentially some of the green, the shipping, some of the domestic sources, the burning. 
The bottom graph here is an east to west transect. So you have Bristol on the left of the graph and London on the right. And you can see that in London, actually, road traffic is a sizable portion of the air pollution that we experience on a day to day basis. The progress that we've been making is, is quite substantial. So you can see that this, this is another graph from DEFRA. All the citations are at the bottom of the slides if ever you wanted to, to dig these out. That yellow component that you see declining through time is the proportion of our, our traffic borne pollution, our traffic generated pollution that comes from exhaust fumes. So we are effectively tackling exhaust fumes, things like ULEs are beginning to work, the standards to which we maintain our vehicles are beginning to work. But we have this very strong remnant here. We have the blue, which is tyre wear, the orange that is brake wear, and the grey that is the road abrasion. These are dust, these are quite heavy particles that lurk around our roads. And that even with the transition to electrification, we're still going to experience these alongside roads. I began to, to understand air pollution a little more and to realise that the traffic generated air pollution is these many things. So we have the, the gases which tend to disperse and disperse and attenuate quite rapidly away from vehicles. But there's also this particulate component. We have really big particulate matters, the obvious dusts, but we also have smaller particulate matters in the air. The, the smaller things, they're called things like PM 2.5 and PM 10, which reflects the diameter of the size of the particles. Now, these do tend to move with the wind. And we know the, that we can do some things to stop them. One of the most obvious things we can do is build a wall. And I thought this was largely enough until I was standing in my child's playground and I could smell the, the vileness in the air and I could see the opacity in the air. And through my reading, I began to discover that, that actually what happens is that some air pollution comes over and it eddies around behind the wall. And you can get these areas where you get just as much air pollution the other side of the wall as on the traffic side of the wall, because the vortices and the eddies it creates holds it there. So a wall, a very, very tall wall, could do an extremely good job, but we often don't have that opportunity. So I, I began to think, well, you know, what else can we do? Surely just, you know, if a wall isn't working, what else might there be? So I started doing some interdisciplinary reading. I started looking at, at work around airfields. How do they stop the, you know, the great, jets of, of aviation fuel remnants and exhaust, how do they deal with that? And, and actually, there are some really interesting things going on. Um, there was some, some, you know, now reasonably old work, it's almost 10 years old, by Mike Bennett's team around Cranfield Airports, where they just put these very simple baffles. And by having those baffles, they created more turbulence and they reduced the amount of pollution leaving the airfield between 40 and 60% just by putting these very simple baffles in. I also began to read about uh, how we dealt with noise pollution. And on the continent, we have these extremely effective walls. This is called a Dordrecht design or Geluidswall, and they stop noise dissipating out from motorways. But of course, they, they may well be doing a very good job in dealing with pollution. So I started to speculate on this, and this is the point at which I start walking around my colleagues' offices and going, what if, and, and we're lucky in, in, in the office, we have whiteboards everywhere, and people got very used to me come wandering in and drawing on their whiteboards, and they were very, very patient with me, for which I will be eternally grateful. And I began to talk to people and say, well, you know, what would happen if we put these baffles vertically on a wall? Because we can retrofit this kind of thing. And I I started to talk to people about this and I met the most enormous amount of teeth sucking. So you, you approach someone and you talk to them about it and they start to go. And through that, I began to understand some of the constraints. 
Many of the walls that we have around are designed to be a specific height and to carry a particular load. And as soon as you start to think about making them taller, the sail becomes too much. So there are problems with some existing walls. Another concern that was raised at that point was if you stop the pollution from going away and into your playground or into your area where people who are, have you know, houses alongside motorways or alongside big A roads coming in and out of cities. What's going to happen to the people on the roadside? So if you have a cycleway there, then you, you might well be exposing people more. But if you don't have a cycleway there, if it's going back onto the traffic, then that's a different issue. Most modern cars have air filter systems and certainly the drivers have the opportunity to close their windows. Whereas children playing in a playground on the other side simply don't have the opportunity to close their lights. So I was beginning to think about this and I, I sufficiently persuaded some people, mainly the, the very marvellous Hugh who works in our department, Hugh Woodward, to run a couple of models and see what would happen. And from this and, and with great support from Agamemnon Otero of Energy Garden, we developed some simple models and these are very simple. This is the beginning of a story really. So without any walls, if you look on the left, the source pollution from traffic just you know, dissipates out. So you can see that once you get a wall there, it helps. But you can also see very clearly that you can get these eddies behind the wall into the playground or into the area that people are living in. And those are less than ideal. But that actually fitting baffles to walls really constrains the dispersal. And the air behind the walls is very much cleaner. So we've published this recently. It's in Cities and Health. They've been marvellously supportive as well. So it's out there now. This idea is out there that, that the shape of a wall matters. It's not just that there's a wall. I mean, obviously, if you could have an infinitesimally high wall, that would be brilliant, but you lose light, you lose all sorts of things. You may have to have a very wide base. So really tall walls are often very, very impractical. Whereas a simple retrofit baffle can do a very good job of reducing the air pollution behind in your free space for a fraction of the cost. Now, at the beginning, Jemima was telling you that my real interest is in, is in green and in the urban green, apart from my interest in insects, which is all consuming half the time. And green space comes into urban areas in very, very many ways. We, we use our blue-green solutions to deliver ecosystem services. And I really strongly advocate for as much green as we can possibly have in an urban area and as much accessible green for people because it promotes our well-being, it, it helps manage climate change, it helps manage urban temperature, it does help with air quality in many instances, it helps our water management because green spaces tend to be very much more absorbent than the grey of the city and it helps give a place for biodiversity. It helps us to have systems that are resilient and functional because the habitats that we have, the more diverse they are, the greater their resilience is. Now, we, we've been talking about green, urban green, and there is quite a lot of, of bandwagonism going on and there's quite a lot of lip service going on. And there's quite a lot of, of weaker design of the urban green. A lot of people are interested. A lot of people often think the answer is simple and it's not. And we need to be doing very good science on urban green in order to understand how the subset of species that are in the urban environment perform relative to diverse subsets out in, in more wilder greens. And the way to do this is, is to combine scientists with designers to produce optimal solutions that function well for cities. Now, there is some excellent science going on. There's a team at the University of Dublin doing really good stuff. This comes from a paper from the University of Surrey, where Prashant Kumar's lab is. And they're doing a lot of work on trying to understand how different green space 
and different green elements can work in the city. And we know from their work, for instance, that actually having trees in urban canyons, and I often think of places like Holland Park Avenue, can stop the mixing of air and actually contain the air pollution from vehicles. So the solution for a street like that is really to reduce the vehicle generated pollution. So sometimes trees don't work to do the right thing. So it's very important to think about what the green is and where we put the green so that things work. So from the work that we've done from that initial modelling, we began to think about how you can integrate green with these battle systems so that we deliver multiple benefits in one fell swoop. And what we came up with was the idea of, of fitting the shaping elements, but that have some holes. There's quite a lot of work on how porous something can be before it stops becoming effective in doing its job. And this is a, a paper up on the left, which shows that you can actually have some porosity before it, its effectiveness falls away. So here we're creating something that is perforated so it doesn't stop water coming through. Letting water through is actually quite important because water in a heavy rainstorm is a very heavy load and that affects the structure. So if we can have these slightly perforated baffles through which green can entwine, we can get multiple benefits all round. We can deliver effective biodiversity, we can deliver beautiful things and we can also protect the people behind by reducing the exposure to the air pollution that they feel. Things don't need to be as tall as that. As I said earlier in the talk, when we're looking at the, the really heavier dusts that we're going to be left with as we reduce the gaseous pollutants that come from exhaust, and that is the future, we will have fewer of those. Things don't need to be that tall. We can have simpler solutions. And thank you to, to Petra for this lovely illustration. So beside roads, we can have simple shaped baffles behind which we can have green elements. And the baffles stop the, the, the pollution coming towards the people, but they also stop the things like salts that we put on road in winter coming onto the plants. So they protect both people and plants and give us a maximum opportunity for having green space that protects our children and protects us from the, the nastiness of traffic dust. And these are, these are very simple and these are not expensive and these are great retrofit, easy solutions. But it doesn't need to stop there. Once we, you have the insight that actually using the shaping can begin to manipulate airflows, we can use sculptural elements in the city to introduce specific airflows. We can create elements that, that might divert clean air from above into a particularly polluted spot. Or we can create sections where a little bit of heat maybe might help the polluted air to rise out of the way. And we can integrate the green to these as well. We can have wonderful sculptural green elements explicitly designed to help airflow in hard to reach or difficult subsets. Now, this kind of passive infrastructure can be very, very beautiful. And I hope the, that we will begin to think in this way. I have very many huge thank yous. I want to thank Hugh for doing the modelling and Aga for helping drive this along. I want to thank Mark Bergman, my boss in the CEP, and many of my colleagues, Audrey de Nazelle, who works very much on, on how we change our behaviour to reduce air pollution and to reduce our exposure to air pollution. I want to thank all the researchers and the students around me who contribute so much to this field and, and on whose shoulders I stand when I come to reading these. I, I certainly want to thank those who've been very patient as I just scroll all over their whiteboards in their offices and interrupt them yet again. 
I want to thank the National Lottery Communities Fund for helping us to take this work forward and, and to Transport for London, who are going to enable us to have some tests, some real world tests of these systems. And I want to thank the wonderful ladies who helped me with illustrations. So thank you to everybody. I'm very glad to take any questions on this. Thank you. Sorry, sorry there, Jamal, you're on mute. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Tilly. That was fantastic. Very pragmatic, which I think is what we need in this scenario. I think that you have come up with very practical ways to deal with pollution in cities. And we've got some excellent questions. And I think that one that um, certainly will resonate with you is the idea of green space in cities. We have one from Fabio and he says there are great contributions and designs on vertical gardens in Latin America, Italy. What would be the role of the vertical garden in your project or how would this grow and how would this work in terms of cities in the future? Oh, I, I think that there's wonderful work done on vertical gardening. Um, it's not my speciality. I understand a, a certain amount about it, but I think certainly things that enable us to grow food in cities is, is very, very wonderful. Um, in terms of air pollution, the, the, the shaping element is what does the most to, to reduce our exposure to air pollution. The plants themselves do absorb a little bit of air pollution and they do absorb, i.e. they you know, get particles sticking to them. And if you have plants with really hairy leaves, then more particles will stick to them. Um, Karina Carada, a student in our department, has done some excellent work reviewing that. And but one of the things she found is that actually the, the plants themselves do relatively little. They help us manage airflow, but in terms of absorbing the, the pollutants, they do relatively little. I think that was my question as well, as you always talk about the robustness of nature and how well it can work in sort of certain scenarios. And I was wondering with your sort of planting knowledge um, on a micro level, level, whether there was any, any plants that actually worked, you know, for longevity, because I think we've all, the, the issue often with those kind of green walls is that you look at them and they're beautiful for a little bit, and then they start looking terrible and you have the sense, you know, how, how are they really doing any good? Well, I think green walls in many situations do do an enormous amount of good because they lift our spirits. There are some magnificent and beautiful green walls around the place, but they tend to come from places which have the budget to look after them. So they're, they're expensive to plant, they're expensive to maintain, and uh, they're, when, when, when beautiful and when well maintained, they are absolutely wonderful. Alas, in themselves, they do very little for they do very little for air pollution and they are a maintenance burden. So I strongly advocate the idea that you prepare some ground well, you sacrifice some, a, a plot of ground and you plant into that and you plant things that we know tend to survive. I mean, we are having to deal with an era of global warming and we know that the weather is changing in this country. But things like ivies are still doing really very well and they provide amazing nest sites for birds. They, they can be beautiful in different colourways. And by being in the ground, they are likely to be much more robust. They're, they will require less maintenance. They will look after themselves much more. So green walls are, are astoundingly beautiful and you can often have really good educational examples in playgrounds for children, you can have examples where, you know, vegetables grow and you get for very little space sacrifice, a really good learning tool. But I, in the summer holidays, it's tougher. Well, I think it's interesting what you said about Holland Park Avenue with its plane trees and now how you really do have to look at the variety of tree that you're planting to ensure that it's really going to work. Um, in the future that it can grow big it can be fine small but if it grows big it's going to be uh, it's not going to work so well 
Yes, and we have to, it's, it's hard to anticipate that. You know, we want to be planting native. We really want to be planting trees that are part of the natural biodiversity of our country. But if we want to have a tree that's going to be robust in, in an urban circumstance, we have to be very careful about what we plant and where we plant and how big it will grow. <laughs> um, going to another point, which was about modelling, John Brownridge, he's asking, is it necessary to perform modelling in every situation or are there some simple rules that can be applied when designing pollution barriers? And also with that question, I was curious, do scientists and designers work well together coming up with solutions? Oh, OK, two things. There. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go with the modelling first. I think there will be general rules emerging. I think that, you know, in this country, we tend to have a reasonably consistent wind direction from the southwest. Of course, it's not always from the southwest and in cities, it eddies around the place. But there will be some reasonably robust rules that say in this kind of circumstance, this kind of shape will work. In some situations, you may need to do modelling of the specific shape, but this kind of work is becoming much more tractable. We've got more powerful computers, more people know how to do it. And being able to work with designers is now being promoted. The interdisciplinary work in which social scientists come together with engineers and designers and modelers is growing. And there is a real emphasis on having interdisciplinary solutions to problems. We're becoming very much aware that, that actually the most sustainable solutions also involve the community. So there's no point in us imposing things if they don't work for the community. Everything that we do in terms of urban design must also include the, the who will be there and how they contribute. You know that, you, know, you deal with culture all the time. But it is one of the great things that's happening at the moment in science broadly is the notion of the different expertises coming together to contribute to holistic solutions to many problems that we face and it's a wonderful thing. I think the also the idea of listening is really key and I think that in at Greenwich Peninsula we are really aware that we don't talk to the residents before we you know do stuff in our environment and really get their feedback we're going to we're going to come unstuck because it's they are using the space and that's you know that's really important and um, we've got I was intrigued by the idea of that you really are kind of revealing the invisible that we in a way have no idea of what is going on i mean we're aware of the fact that the there is there are you know unpleasantnesses in our streets and that we have to um you know live with that and we have a question here which is can you explain the very large contribution of to PM 2.5, which I don't know what that is, but I'm, I'm, I imagine it was one of those particles and um, that I think you said we can't do much about. What are they? And that's from someone anonymous. Oh, yes. so, there are a mix of things. Um, the, one of the most surprising components is salt. And I think that's because we're, you know, we're an island, we're surrounded by sea and actually you get quite a lot of salt coming over. So tiny, tiny particles of salt. Um, Quite a bit of it is agriculture. So it's the farming that goes on in this country that produces dusts and produces tiny fractions of particulate matter. And we are, you know, we're, we're in a part of the country where if you go to the West, we have vast amounts of agriculture. And agriculture is changing. We, we are moving on to an era where the countryside is beginning to change. The new government plans for the countryside and the way in which they will reward farmers are moving the country in a different direction. And there may be an effect on this kind of particulate matter that, that you know, is, is just world dust and agricultural dust. There may be an effect on that. And that would be really very marvellous if there was. But we're not going to know until we've had a chance to test it. As with many things, we can, you know, we can speculate, we can produce models, we can be very firmly convinced it's going to work. And, and then we try and test it and we find actually it's not quite as effective as all that. And actually, if we did this, it would work better. 
So we're going to go through a phase of, of beginning to understand how what we do agriculturally and in the countryside will change the particulate matter. But the, the, we're going to be planting a lot more trees. That's certainly evident. Uh, that this is a, there is a movement towards greater tree planting in many areas. But actually, you know, trees can emit what we call BVOCs, biogenic volatile organic compounds, which, and uh, also pollens. Pollen dust is, is a very tricky issue with many trees. So a lot of that large chunk of dark blue that you saw in that slide is stuff that comes from the rural environment and may change and may diminish with changing rural strategy. I think it's interesting looking at countryside in relation to the city as well. I think that's obviously important. Um, we've got um, lots more questions coming in, so I'm going to, to, to give you some of those. From Magali, this looks fantastic. Are you making a prototype? Oh, no, we're very much hoping to. Yeah, so we, we, we're working towards that at the moment. Yes, we, as I said, we've got with um, Energy Garden, we have a grant from the National Lottery uh, Communities Fund and we're working with TfL and we're going to be developing prototypes and seeing what really works. So that's the next stage of this work is modelling different shapes. We're going to hire someone who's going to do much more robust and intensive modelling and we are going to start testing to see what the model says, you know, what the, what the model says, is it borne out? Because, you know, it's all very well a model saying it's going to be 30% better, but actually you need the data to say, yes, it is. And once we have that, then we can begin to do it. I'm particularly excited about the elements of urban design that we can go on to do, the, the idea that we can create these wonderful shapes that will really enhance spaces, both visually and in terms of airflow management. I think that's a tremendous opportunity that we have and I can't wait to work with designers on projects like that. That combination of aesthetic and actually making some difference to the, the way we live in our cities, that's really exciting. It's and we've got a, a question, that we, it's really exciting. Um, uh, we've got a, an, another anonymous um, question, which is, are there plants that are better for the urban, now you're gonna know this word better than I am, phytomining, and can the particles be absorbed by these plants? Uh, phyto, phyto mining is, it's, a, it's very interesting. It's, a, it's effectively using plants to extract most often nasty things from the earth. So the plants that you plant over landfill, some plants will absorb very nasty toxins and then you can take the plants away. You can, you can harvest them like, you know, a willow crop, a coppice crop. You can take it away and dispose of that somewhere else and you're detoxifying the soil. Um, of course, you could, there are some plants that, that do phyto mining as in in a more positivist sense in that you can have plants that absorb particular uh, things like silver and you can use them to extract the metals that you want from the earth so it's not just detoxification but active mining through the use of plants because their roots and the mycorrhizal fungi with which they partner through the soil actually bioconcentrate these elements into the plant and you can use those so different plants do different things in different places. And if we're looking to detoxify soils, there are certainly some plants that will work for that. It will depend on what it is you want to extract and how moist the soil is in that circumstance and on many other things, because it's all very well planting a plant that's good at phyto mining. But if it's the wrong environment for that plant, it's never going to do a good job. But how would that feed into your project? That's I can't quite imagine how that would be helpful in terms of you know, preventing pollution in cities. Well, I think a, a lot of the soils along our roads are pretty yick. They've they've had dusts and salts and vehicle, you know, vehicle dust falling upon them for decades and decades and decades. And it might be a very good solution to use some phyto mining plants for a number of cycles to clean up that soil so that other plants could then come in in the future. So you could use the plants themselves to clean up the soil. It's an interesting idea. 
Yeah, no, it's a great idea. Got another um, question from Lavinia. What resources would you suggest for designers and engineers to learn more about the developing technology that encourages interconnectedness with nature? Now, I think that's a fab question. Oh, I, I would suggest undergraduates. I've always found them rather marvellous. You set them essays and off they go and they find out these things. But yes, I mean, you're absolutely right in that there is often a great disconnect in the accessibility of information between practitioners and scientists. And it's, it's one of the big missing bricks that I'm very, very concerned about. I, I really wish that the continuing professional development of many practitioners involved being sent on courses to understand about ecosystem services or to understand about specific things. But actually, you know, most of the practitioners, people working in, in the local councils, the arboricultural officers, the landscape planning officers are under such tight budget constraints that they get to do very, very little continuing professional development. And the courses don't necessarily exist for them to go on. So I, I would be very open to helping people develop courses. And, and now that we've learned in the past couple of years that, that actually we can do an awful lot online, developing these online courses with an appropriate syllabus that, that gave people access to well digested information that helps them in their practice would be a wonderful thing to do. But I think that also you are unusual in this because you have done practical, you know, tree, you were a tree surgeon, you've taken part with trees, you've really, they're sort of part of your makeup. And, and then you go on and you do something which is uh, maybe more esoteric, but you still kind of got that grounding. And I wonder how that affects the way you look at, yeah, pollution today or your scientific practice. Oh yes, it makes me roll my eyeballs all the time. Yes. <laughs> no, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, that's, I'm aware of many things having had the practical experience, having actually, you know, dug endless holes to plant trees. I was, I was very well taught at Agricultural College. Mer Meris would taught me, well, we know how to plant trees. But once you're out there in the world of work, you're required to do it so fast with such little resource that actually you're planting a tree a quarter as well as you've been taught to plant the tree. And then the tree aftercare then is, is lacking through the, the lack of dedication of resource to ongoing maintenance. And that, that is a real pity. So that's the, that's the financial constraint. But yes, so it's, it's a tough one to be able to integrate everything and everyone and look forwards. And I certainly sometimes look at academic questions and go, don't we know that? And find that Although the law, as in L-O-R-E, the kind of the, the anecdote in practice may be very robust, but in fact, science doesn't know this because no one's actually written it up in a scientific paper. So you get scientists who really, really want to help. But without that basic practical knowledge, I think the first thing that the scientists should do is go out and talk to people. Uh, talk to the practitioners and then devise their research program from that and that it's it's you know you could go chasing off down the wrong path for a very long time because you don't know some very simple and basic information that is common law in in the practitioner world well i think that's what i said in my introduction about you is that you practice what you preach you're involved in it um and you take it in your hands but I've still got lots of questions um Eleanor uh says is it possible to apply this to highly dense cities and increase residents well-being as well yes yes absolutely and anything you do to keep the the vehicle you know generated air pollution off people will help you know, this, as, as you could see in, in that last picture, you don't, you don't need much space. We can retrofit the baffles to walls. We can put these extra curved pieces down on the edge of the pavement. It may infringe our civil liberties to cross the road wherever we want to, because we will have barriers there, but it will make the air better on the pavement to a certain extent. 
So yes, we can fit them anywhere we want to, and we can retrofit into the urban environment really easily. That's what we want to hear. Um, another question from Sam Dawson. Has anyone looked at pollution in car parks? How can this be applied in this area? Very good question. Oh, well, the, how it spreads out of car parks? Well, I imagine how do you, you know, you've got cars coming in. How do you prevent, yeah, the, the pollution from going outside car parks? Sam, if yes, you want to. Enclosed bubbles would be great, but I think the people parking their cars might be a little distressed by that. I mean, there's certainly been uh, really interesting and quite shocking work on how much children in cars are exposed to various pollutants when their parents refuel the cars in garages. And that led to a, a change in design of the nozzles. Uh, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we've gone as far as we should down that path yet. Although, you know, fueling vehicles will be changing and we are moving towards very, very different fueling for our vehicles. Um, I don't know about the car parks. It's a good question. One you'll have to think about. Um, I think this is a question I think that's we all feel. Um, and Philippa Robb is uh, watching from YouTube has said, um, is not the key to lowering pollution in major urban cities to tackle transport, particularly private driving? I'm not, this is not a question that you can answer, but I think it is an interesting question. Right, and it's a question I have an opinion on. I, I think that we are moving towards a situation where privately owned vehicles will become less common. Obviously, we need behaviour change. We need more people on bicycles. We need more people walking. We need people taking their children to school on foot instead of putting them in the car. Yeah, I work at Imperial. I cycle to work most of the time. And when I go along Kensington High Street in the morning, the vast majority of cars are people driving their children to school. And I, f I find that tricky. I, I was always fairly robust with my kids because I thought if they were going to sit still in the classroom all day, they needed to be exercised first. So come rain or shine, they had to walk to school or take the bus or walk to the bus and take the bus. But they needed some movement first. But we do need to get behaviour change. And Audrey de Nazelle in my department works on, on, you know, what are the things that, that can get people riding their bicycles? What are the cues? And once we begin to understand people a little better, we can push them in the direction of much more active transport. We have a PhD student, Esther, who is just finishing up and uh, she's done excellent work on trying to work out what the, you know, the key mechanisms are to push people onto their bicycles, what makes people cycle. We need active transport. It cleans up the urban environment, it helps our health. We need it. As you know, I'm totally with you and cycle everywhere and think it's so important. And actually, there's an awful lot of infrastructure that has been created in, in, in West London at the moment for cyclists, which I really hope will help. Um, but I can also see that, uh, that, you know, for people who walk, it's, it's important that the, the fumes from the roads aren't kind of inflicting them all the time. And we've got another talk, and we've got another question from Lavinia again, who says, what kind of plants could be used in these sculptural pieces? And I'm assuming she's, she's talking about the, um, the the slide with the two sculptures, one with and one without um, greenery. Um, would they be chosen case by case for each individual location, or are there usual species that would be more general generally used in in many cases? Um, I, I think that there are certainly some some species that cope very well with a bit of hard pruning, so that they maintain the shape. They have to be able to climb the heights that you intend it to be. Um, and they have to be able to cope with some hard pruning because the hard pruning is likely to be done with, with something reasonably mechanical, with be a type of pruning. So there are some plants that, that respond very well to that kind of thing and that cope quite well with the vicissitudes of urban environment. So provided that the, the root space is given some attention at planting, you can get quite a lot of, of different plants in there. You don't want too straggly a plant because then it won't keep the shape if the shape is an important component of, of the functionality of it. 
you might not want a, a, a lanicera or something like that, which you know becomes wonderfully straggly. You want something that might grow closer to its support. Some of the climbing hydrangeas climb quite well like that, the ivies do, and they can both take quite a hard and mechanical prune. So yes, there, there are some plants that might be genuinely quite good at the job, but they're also in different places going to be culturally relevant plants. So outside, you know, outside of doctor's surgery, if you had a particular set of, of, of airflow mechanisms there, you might have medicinal plants going through that. And there's opportunity for thematic plants as well as just the, the kind of standard, it will survive plants. And that's one of the big drivers of what we plant in the urban environment is, will it live? Because you could plant the best plant for air pollution in the whole wide world, but if it doesn't actually manage to live in that circumstance, you're wasting your money on maintenance and you're struggling and it looks struggling and horrible. Yeah, it's about appropriate planting, making yeah. sure that it, it works for the environment for sure. Uh, although olive trees seem to be doing very well in London at the moment. Now we've got one last question. This is our final question. Thank you, Tilly. Um, and it's what what's the prospect of reducing pollution from tyres, brakes and road wear apart from reducing traffic flow? Have you got any thoughts about this? Again, not necessary. And this is from Mark Bergman. I think that one of the things that, that we have to face is that electrical cars are heavier. And one of the, the proposed substitutes for lithium is sodium, and that's even heavier than lithium. So electric cars are heavy, so we are going to get more road wear, we are going to get more tyre wear, we are going to get more brake wear in places where you know vehicles brake at traffic lights and things like that. And that's where some of these systems are going to be extremely important because at traffic lights you have people waiting and cars breaking. So having something near sets of lights would be very, very helpful. I think that with heavier vehicles, we may change our road surfaces gradually. It will be a long and slow and rolling thing. Um, there's also the potential of having kind of almost inbuilt hoovers on cars that would sit within the wheel and capture the brake dusts. There is an excellent MSc programme run partly by the Dyson School of Design and partly by the Royal College of Art. And a couple of years ago, there, some students there came up with some very interesting solutions to exactly this kind of problem is how, how do you manage these heavy dusts that are going to, to come in the future? So there are prospects of solutions. I don't know that much about them myself, but I know a man who does. And again, it's something that we need to keep looking at and yep. not getting and being aware of. And, and I thought that it was very interesting that you talked about resilience. And I think that in all these things, we've got to be resilient. Um, I would just like to first say a big thank you to you all for coming and joining us this afternoon. Uh, air pollution is something that a lot of us deal with every day, and we certainly do in London. So it's a pleasure to listen to Tilly talking about it with such enthusiasm and knowledge. And we know that there are serious people addressing a serious issue. Tilly, thank you very much for a really interesting and enlivening talk today. Oh, thank, thank you, and thank you everybody for coming.